James 2. <clears throat> now, you know, we started James 2 from uh, verses 1 through 8. Uh, actually, 1 through 9. Actually, th actually, 1 through 13. We have been dealing with the sin of partiality. And he gave an illustration, remember, of visitors coming to the church, to the assembly, and being shown preference to seating. Uh, the wealthy were seated in certain locations of the congregation and the poor people will put off into another part of the category of the congregation and in fact maybe sitting at the feet of others because and there was plenty of room to put it for a chair they had them set on the floor and James remarks about that and he calls that a sin of partiality a sin of bias prejudice partiality and he says the violation, the reason it's a sin. Now listen to me carefully. The reason he says it's a sin is because it violates the royal law. And he calls the Roman law, the royal law, Leviticus 19.18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, every time Christ is going to quote that, every time he's going to refer to this, he's going to put it in the dynamics of Deuteronomy 6.5. So here's what Jesus wants us to learn about the royal law. Because the royal law, you're going to see, when Jesus talks about the royal law, he's going to talk about the Ten Commandments. I call it the Big Ten. He's going to talk about the Ten Commandments. Now listen, it's important. Deuteronomy 6.5 falls on the God side, and Leviticus 19.18 falls on the man side. You know the Ten Commandments are divided into two sections, the God side and the man side. Four to the God side, six commandments to the man side. Exodus, verse, Exodus 20th chapter. Are you, you familiar with that? Okay. Well, if you're not, you should read in a little bit on it. Now, here's, here, here's his point. When Jesus talks about the royal law of love, Deuteronomy 6, 5 fits the God side of it. Love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength. Leviticus, and that's, that's very important. Because it is the way that you love God is the way he loved you is the way you're to love yourself and others. Look, the way God loves you is the way you're to love yourself and others. He tells you the same thing in Ephesians, the sixth chapter about forgiveness. The, listen, the way God forgives you, you're to forgive yourself and to forgive others. Agreed? Oh, it's... Well, I haven't had prayer yet, have I? Thank you. Maybe that's why we're struggling a little bit here, or at least I am. Let's, let's stop and have a word of prayer, and we'll come back to the subject matter. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit for preparation for Bible study. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin in the categories of Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. They have to be confessed and bring you back into spirituality. 1 John 1, 9 says, confess your sin. He will forgive you. He's just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That puts you back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is the key to Bible study. So I give you a moment for that procedure. Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us the Word of God, both by automobile and by the Internet. We pray that people in the Internet would have the same discipline of classroom that we have here, uh, not to be distracted by telephones or televisions or other things that uh, would be distracting to them as if they were in this classroom themselves. 
I pray that they would confess their sins before the Lord if they're believers. And if not, pay attention uh, in the sermon to how you will become a believer and can grow in the word of God because the word of God is a dead book for people who are dead. We don't ask dead people to read the Bible. We ask living people, people who have been born again because Jesus Christ died on a cross for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give them spiritual life as a gift from the grace of God. I pray today, Father, that this would be the exercise in this classroom as the Holy Spirit ministers the truth of the word of God to our souls and our souls into the fellowship with God in Jesus' name, amen. Well, do, what you have to remember is Deuteronomy 6, 5, when Jesus puts these two together, he says, upon these two commandments, these two commandments complete the whole thinking of the Old Testament. Upon these two hang all of the law and the prophets, he says. That's, that's everything in the Old Covenant. <clears throat> then when he comes ready to say to the church, I give you a new commandment, he brings the old commandment of love, love God, love your neighbor. He brings that concept and says, now the way this is transferred is through Christ, through the church to other people, even the world. A new commandment I give you to love one another as Christ has loved you. And that's the love you carry to the world because they need Christ. Evangelism is all about love. Listen, over the years as a pastor, people who really love their people know their people are not saved. Pray for them with great intensity out of love. When they have Christians, when they have family members who are carnal, they're not spiritual. They're backslidden or what we refer to as reversionistic. It breaks their heart. And they pray for them with great intensity. And God does. Listen, God does some marvelous things. So the key word is love. So it's a love God with all your heart, soul, and mind because that's the way God loves you. That's the way God loves you. Therefore, you should love yourself that way, shouldn't you? You should love yourself that way. I meet so many Christians that they don't use the word love. They say, like. I don't like myself very well. That's because you haven't fallen in love with God. You have not fallen in love with God. Listen, if you love God with all your soul and your mind and heart, that's the way he loves you. God loves you. He doesn't ask you to love him the way he does not love you. He asks you to love, you, love, love yourself the way he loves you. He loves you with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his strength, and all of his might. How do I know it? Because he hung his son on the cross for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. We know that. You're to love yourself because God loved you enough to send his son to pay the price for it. You don't have to love yourself because you look in the mirror every day. You have to lo love yourself because you have to look at God every day. Now, once you learn to do that, you're ready to love other people. Once you do that, you're ready to love other people. Because you're to love other people with the love that you've been loved by. You're to love other people with that same love. And by this, all men will know that you are what? The disciples of Jesus Christ. Because you have love for one another that's unconditional. Unconditional. And so, the, my point about all this, when he introduces this whole concept to everybody, and this is the concept he's introducing... He says, we have a problem in the church, James says. We have a problem in the church of Jerusalem. The Christian church of Jerusalem, they had a problem. James is a pastor, and he says, we have a problem. Uh, you you, uh, you want to keep, keep the whole law. You don't realize that Jesus Christ has fulfilled the whole law. Agreed? Jesus Christ has fulfilled the whole law. He said, I didn't come to abolish it. You know, in Matthew 5, he didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. 
He said, so, you know, why are you going back to something that's already been cooked? Why are you going back in the kitchen when you got the foods already on the table? You're back in the kitchen preparing stuff. The meal's already done. What are you doing? So, you know, and every day he's got the meal cooked for you. And so the James says, look, we got, but here's what he does. It shocks everybody. He said, listen, if you want to be under the whole law and you violate one part of it, I don't care what a part, I don't care whether it's a minor part or a major part. I don't care if it's adultery or partiality. I don't care if it's murder or partiality. I don't care if it's one of the big ten or some other one. When you look at the big ten on the man's side, partiality is way down the scale, isn't it? Yet he put it equal. Oh. Well, look at here. Look at verse 9, 10, and 11, 12, 13. Let's read. Let me read to you. But if you show partiality, and he's told you what he means by that, you are committing a sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one, notice the word point is in italics, and stumbles in one, he's become guilty of how many? Oh, how many? <laughs> Man, who would want to go under the law with that hanging over you? Okay. Has become guilty of all. All like what? The whole law. Oh, wait. Let me read it again because you've been... Whoever keeps the whole law puts himself under that concept and yet stumbles in one, no matter how big or small, he's become guilty of all. Now, let, let me show you what he means by big and small because there are no sins big and small. Hello? There are... <laughs> no, 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 no. There are no big ones and little ones. Jesus Christ didn't have... Well, I died on the cross for some of the big ones, but the little ones, you got to take care of yourself. They didn't do that. Now, here's what he's, listen, what he says. For he who says, do not commit adultery, now we're in the Big Ten, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. That's what he meant. But listen. They didn't violate any of the Big Ten, right? James, the second chapter, 1 through 13, what, what was their sin? Partiality. Bias, prejudice. And gave an illustration exactly that you wouldn't have to guess what he meant. And everybody in the church knew it because they saw it happen every, every time they assembled. They had the snob section, right? And then the ones they looked down their nose on section. You know what he just compared that to? What did he just compare that to? Murder and adultery. He compared it to the Big Ten. He compared it to murder and adultery. You're guilty of the sin. If you're guilty of sin, you violated the whole deal. The sin of partiality is just as bad as the sin of murder, and the sin, as far as a sin, is just as bad as the sin of, as a sin, as a sin. Don't get nuts with me. As a sin in the eyes of God. It was for sin that he sent his son to die on a cross. It wasn't for the big tent or the small. He sent him to die for all sin. There was no big and little. All right. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just telling you what he said. 
so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. You see, what was going on was the law of liberty. They was putting here and putting there. And listen, they were missing what it was all about. About love. Love yourself with respect so you can love other people with respect. Not respect to who they are, not, not respect to the color of their skin or their pocketbook or their education, right? Pretty hard, isn't it? I mean, this is pretty tough. Not if you look at sin, but if you look at the different types of sin, you go, well, my sin wasn't that bad. Was it sin? Yeah, well, it hung Christ on the cross. What sin didn't Christ die for? See, that, that would be the question. Died for all of them. <clears throat> for judgment, verse 13, for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay. Now, here's what I did on your paper. I looked at the context. I'm in verse 9, 10, 11. But I looked at my context, and I broke my context down into four points. A command is given in verse 1. Stop, do, stop having, he says. And then the conduct which is verses 3 through 7 of, of the example of partiality, the sin of partiality, then the commandment, the royal law of Ludwig 1918, and then the conviction of 9 through 13, the law of transgressor, which is my subject, the law. The purpose of my lesson today is to show the superiority of the doctrines of the new covenant over the doctrines of the old covenant because Jesus Christ filled all, fulfilled them all, Right? Listen, in Matthew 5, he said, I didn't come to abolish, I came to fulfill. In Romans, in Romans the 10th chapter, verse 4, he said, by the coming of Christ, he's put an end to the law. By that, he means he's completed them. An end to them means he's fulfilled them. So we need, need to pay attention to that. Why would you put yourself back under the law and then, and, and then play Russian roulette with the idea of the law of transgressor because the law of transgression says if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of what? All. That's pretty heavy. That's pretty heavy. You know the two, the two he mentioned? Adultery and murder? You know, you know guilty of all? You know, what, you know what, what judgment they brought? Death. I mean, it's, there's, the person who commits that under, under certain aspects of law was subject to capital punishment. I'm pretty serious, wouldn't you think? You want to stand under that kind of law? And listen, it didn't matter which one of the big, because whatever one you, were, whatever one you did were guilty of what? All. I mean, and listen, we, we have been freed through Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ has freed us from that whole system. We're not under that system anymore. We're not under that system. Don't let people put you under it. That is not a system that works for the church. It's anti-freedom in Christ. So let me talk about a couple aspects this morning of this. James established how the law of transgressor works regarding the sin of par partiality in James 2.9. He uses a first-class condition, which says if it's true in the if part, it's true in the then part. That's a first-class condition in the Greek language. Here's what he says. If you show partiality, and we've explained that, then this is true. If you are guilty of the sin of partiality, then this is true. You are committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. That's Mosaic law. Verse 
wow. Wow. The sin of partiality is violating the law of Leviticus 19.18, which is called the royal law. Right? Look. Jeez, people. We need to get a cup of coffee. I I'm going to do mine. Maybe it'll settle me down. I just did something that my professor in homiletics said you never do. So, for those who are taking homiletics this year from me, I just flunked. Well, look. He tells you that what they violated was the royal law of Leviticus 19.18. The sin of partiality is violation of the royal law of Leviticus 19.18, and we well, know, we well know how that thing works, and by the time we get through this second point, we will know it for sure. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal, here's what, here's, here's what he says in James 2.8, first, first class condition. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If that's true in the way your behavior is operating, then this would be true. You are doing well. The word well, kalos, is an adverb. There should be, to make it an adverb, above the O, you draw, draw a little line above it. And that makes that a long O or an omega. That's an adverb. Because there is a kalos that's not an adverb. It's an adjective. So, here we have this idea you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you do this, if you're able to apply the royal law, now listen, against public opinion or congregational opinion, right? Pressure on you. A guy walks in is that, and you slide over and say, here, sit right here. And, and listen, maybe everybody sat in three pews away because they stink. Because they... They, they just walked off the street because God wanted them to be saved. They're sick of the world like the prodigal son. You know, somebody had to be there. Like the prodigal son. Like the woman at the well. Like Ron Adema. There are a lot of ways you can stink, but the, the one is an unbeliever. Everybody stinks. That's why, the, that's why salvation brings a, a wonderful aroma. <laughs> why do I need a wonderful aroma? To show you that you were dead and you stink, but now you're alive and you smell good like the newborn baby smells. I mean, they smell good in the worst of their moment. They smell good. How does that work? And so we have this passage. He says, you are doing well. Now, here's what that, well, the adverb, that's an adverb. You are doing well. You are doing well, present active indicative. Keep this up because you're doing well. You know, that's a motivational idea, isn't it? When somebody is struggling and they come through because they're struggling in the church with the sin of partiality. Would you agree with that with James? But they were, they were starting to get a hold of this idea that it's in violation. When you show partiality, it's in violation of the royal law. So they get, began to make adjustment. He says, when you do that, when you don't buy into that overwhelming, everybody's doing it. Well, I'm not doing anything that everybody else in the church is not doing. Yeah, there's some people because they stink because they're the wrong color, the wrong education, the wrong this. I don't care, James says. We're under the supreme law that comes through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to be that people one day. We're getting there. We're not there yet, but we're on our way. And we're going to need to be that people. And so James, James says you are doing well. What he means by well, 
and I wrote it down so you wouldn't miss it. I didn't, I didn't, want, to, didn't want to take the chance that you wouldn't write it. So I wrote it for you. What James is saying is that you are constantly doing well, I, and he brags on them. No, you always brag on what they're doing well and teach them, listen, and teach them what they're not doing well. You don't brag on one good thing and blame on the other. You don't brag, listen to me now, parenting. You don't brag on one and blame on the other. You don't brag them when they're doing good and rag them when they're doing bad. Because when they're doing good, they're right on line with what you're teaching. When they're doing bad, they need to be, they need to be coached up. In other words, you know the old saying, when you point one out, three are pointing back? You already remember that. When, when people, when people are, are, are working to do well, when they're, when they're in the process of change and doing all those things, and they make mistakes. It's not time for blame. It's time for coaching up. But so, so many of us, we, we have a two-edged sword. On the one hand, we, we give them credit. On the other hand, we blame them when they're not. It's your responsibility to coach them up. There are two guys in my congregation that impressed me as an athlete the way they coached. Davenport and my son-in-law, Owen, Rick Owens. They were the two best coaches with kids I'd ever seen. I wish I could have played with these guys. Because they understood what I just said to you. And that's the kind of a pastor I want to be. I've been the other one. I don't want to be that person. Nothing good comes out of the blame game. I don't want to be that guy. I've been that guy, and I don't like him. As well as other people don't like him. I don't like them. And when you don't like it, then change comes. Change comes. And so we ought to be. This is what, this is what James is trying to accomplish as a leader of the church. He's, he's commend, commending them on the one hand. He, he's trying to explain to him this behavior has got to stop. This is not what the Christian church is about. We, we will never have an appeal to others unless we get this changed. And so he lays it out. He lays his argument out. And then he comes back, and he's nailing this thing down. He doesn't blame them. He said, listen, it's my job to coach you up. And you're doing a good job. I used to play football for a coach that, that, that pepped you up every quarter. We didn't have a halftime talk that was anything. We had quarterly talks. <laughs> good coaches, their coaches coach all the time. When a defense comes off, a good coach has his team coaching, doesn't he? He don't wait to halftime. Uh-uh. And when the offense team comes off, the offensive coach has got them all, all down and teaching them. You watch good coaches, how they coach on the sideline during the ball game. You'll see a good coach. They wonder why, why Alabama wins, 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 wins. You ought to see who he hires, 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 and how he develops his team through a ball game. There, there's your real program. There's your real program. I, I played in my last two years in high school, and there's such a coach. He coached all the time. And who he had under him coached all the time. The halftime the halftime was more about getting his guys fixed up, patched up, ready to go. It wasn't teaching a whole lot. It was maybe changing some ideas, but they changed them right on the, right on the game. They were constantly moving, changing all the time. <laughs> well, so, you know, we try to look at that model. That's a great model, in my opinion. That's a great model. Listen to this. I want, you, I, want, I want you to write these verses down, and I want you to go back, 
And I want you to pay attention. Some of the words that James identifies with the sin of partiality. In the first, um, I think I'm going through, um, like, through the first nine verses. I'm going to go through the first nine. I'm going to, I'm going to give you verses right down. And he's going, to, uh, he's going to associate attitudes with conduct. Watch what he does. Watch this now. In verse 4, in, verse, in the second chapter, verse 4, James 2, 4, he says, he says, have you not made distinctions and become judges with evil, evil motives? How about that? Listen to how he described that to him. He said, you got to clean up your act because this is what your act's producing. Clean up your act because this is what it's producing. And he, and he explains to them what's going on in, the, in their mojo. Got mojo? Got mojo? It, about what's going on. Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. You have dishonored the ones you're partial over. You've dishonored them. By your behavior, you've brought dishonor. You've dishonored that. Listen. Everybody's made in the image according to the likeness of God and is worthy of salvation based on grace through faith and, and given as a gift. Listen to this one. Verse 7. He says, Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called? The rich. The, is it not the rich who you're holding up to a different standard, who oppress you and drag you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the very name that you have been saved by? Listen to this. Verse 9. If you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law. That's in the first nine verses. See, there's a whole lot of things attached to partiality when you confess your sin, you got to clean up your conduct. Confessing your sin takes care of the sin. It doesn't take care of the behavior. A new way of thinking takes care of behavior. Change the way you think will change the way you behave. That's why the Word of God is powerful. In, in Galatians, the third chapter, he takes partiality and he says, you should, there should be no partiality between the Jew and the Gentile, between the free and the slave, between the male and the female. Here he's dealing between the rich and the poor or different social status in our passage. There should be none of that in the church. When we started the School of Biblical Theology, we sat and we met with a group of people that were educated. By that I mean had master's and doctorate degrees and years of experience. And we talked about how we wanted to form and, and run the School of Biblical Theology. And I listened to all of them. Everybody wanted to have a model that screened people in and out. And that makes sense because if, if you're trying to teach to get them to different levels of education, they may not have the ability to comprehend all that. Agreed? I mean, that's why you give inter that's why everybody tests me their mental thinking. I mean, can they, they may not have the capability of putting 20, you know, double digit adding up when you got to carry one. And that may be just their lot in life. And so being able to screen some people to say, well, have they graduated from high school? Have they graduated from college? Have they taken some college courses? What should be our, what should be our standard of acceptance into the School of Biblical Theology? You know why I, I discarded all that? I listened to it all because I thought it was a great argument. And if I was in secular education, that would be true, but I'm in regeneration education. And if you're born again and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you can get whatever God wants you to get, and I should teach you to that level. 
So we don't do any of that. We do none of it. We believe that the Holy Spirit of God is the smartest teacher in the whole wide world and can teach everybody up to the level they've got to be to achieve things in their life according to the perfect plan of God. And we take everybody and put them on the same level and teach them at their level of grasping it in order to make them more efficient and effective as an ambassador for Christ. That's our, our, our motive. And I'll tell you, has that ever been rewarding? Has that ever been rewarding? Because what you discover is that you, no matter who has been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ and has a desire in their heart to learn, they will learn. And they will learn at their own capacity. And so we never try to get them to learn outside their own capacity. We never test them for material. We test them for how they're grasping it. We're not, everybody gets an A. All you got to do is show up. Everybody gets 100 because they're saved. They get another 100 if they know how to walk in the Spirit. They get another 100 if they know how to walk by faith. By the time they get out of our course, if they can do those three things, then they've graduated at a 300% level. And we're happy. We're happy as a tick to have them. Or I don't know how happy a tick is. So don't challenge me on that. In, in Titus 3.8, he says, he says, be careful to engage in, in, in uh, doing good, doing good deeds. He says, be careful, I may be paraphrasing this, but be, be careful uh, to engage in good deeds. That, that's what he means over here. That, that's just what James means when he says, you're doing well. <laughs> you're doing well. My grandson plays for Chelsea. I watched him the other night. Of course, I could only watch one, one person. I couldn't watch the whole game for watching one person and see how well he did. And they played an outstanding ball game. Compared to the first four games, or th three, Billy, they played... Lights out. Now, people could become very critical of it. My grandson plays that offense, and our offense showed up to play ball. Our defense didn't, and we'll learn how to get them both to work. <laughs> but the improvement from the first game, zero, second game, zero, third game, zero, to the fourth game was lights out, Billy. And I'm going to tell you, those offensive guys, they came to play ball, and they left it on the field. We made, we made some mistakes. The defense played okay, but we, we made, once they get that defense to play the way the offense played, they'll win some ball games. They'll win some ball games. I saw real hustle. I saw motivation. I saw a whole lot. You know what, you know what happened? Somewhere during that week, attitude change came. And with it, a performance change. <clears throat> Hopefully, that came through a co good coaching. But somewhere it came through some really leadership on the team where it says, look, we're going to change our attitude. They practiced that way and they played that way. What we, this is what James is after with you and I in the church. That's what James is trying to get his people to do. Look, I'm not asking you to, I'm just asking you to keep working on doing well with this. Do well with this because other people's lives are involved in it. Do well with this. You're doing well. Just stay, stay in that process of treating other people with respect 
be no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't turn anybody down from the cross. He doesn't turn to anybody. He go like, oh, well, I'm sorry, buddy, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're closing up right now. <laughs> uh, well, I only run from certain hours. You'll have to catch me another time. Aren't you glad that he doesn't run office hours from the cross? My good buddy that got three o'clock three got saved three o'clock in the morning in the bathtub, he'd have been left out. Here's my final point in the morning. Listen to James' argument concerning the law of transgressor under Mosaic law in James 2.10. He says, Whoever keeps the whole law, that would be a good legalist. And yet stumbles in one. He's been guilty of all. If you learn nothing else, learn that today. Guilty of all. Guilty. That's judgment, man. Guilty. I'm not talking about a bunch of people getting together and determine that. I'm talking about guilty under a judicial law. Wow. Wow. Here's a couple of verses, be well worth your time. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 and Galatians 5, 9. He's making reference in Galatians. And to stumble in one is to be guilty of all. And James gives us a great example of this in verse 11 when he says, He who says, do not commit adultery, but commits murder. Then he goes on to say, well, then he's been, become a transgressor of the law. And listen, he picked, a, he picked two that carried death penalty. That's, that's, that's a humdinger guilty, right? <laughs> And you know what he's comparing the sin of partiality to? The Big Ten. And he compared it. Look, that there is guilty of all. If you put yourself under the law, you're guilty of one part of the law, guilty of it all. That's what James just showed you. I didn't, I didn't show you that. James showed you that. I'm just telling you. You're like, well, I don't see how that worked. I don't know. I'm just telling you what James said. Now, he was the big legalist, not me. So James gives us an illustration of that. This is coming right out of Exodus 20. James has applied the old, the old covenant doctrinal principle of the sin of partiality. What sin would it violate? Leviticus 19.18. What sin? What would identify the sin? It's a sin against love. What? Love your neighbor as your what? So how am I going to come to a place that I can love myself and love my... Listen, we usually love other people the way we love ourselves. That's the principle, isn't it? So what do you have to... How am I going to change? I need to fall in love with the way God loves me. I love myself the way God loves me. I love myself. I keep looking in the mirror and say, listen, I'm not the person I think I see. I'm the person... I need to see the person that God sees when I look in the mirror. Because he sees a person that was worthy of his love, still is worthy of his love, will always be worthy of his love. Not one day, not one minute, not one second of any day will you not be worthy of it. He proved it by putting his son in a place to bring you into the family. That's a pretty powerful argument. And so, a violation of that law, that law of partiality would include bias, bigotry, prejudiced and all of that. In, in Luke, the 10th chapter, 
in Romans, the 13th chapter, on your paper, in Galatians 5, he goes into great lengths of discussion on that. In that Luke 10 passage, I covered the Good Samaritan. Remember the Good Samaritan? You know what one of the questions he asked at the end of the parable? Which one of the three, you remember the two Levites and this man, which one, which one of the three proved to be the neighbor? You know what their answer was? And he said, that's good, compassion. You know what compassion is? It, it is the expression of love. What, what motivates compassion? Love. I mean, here was, a, here was a Samaritan that exemplified what the Jew should exemplify. Two Jews didn't do it. One Samaritan did it. And the people who responded to Jesus' question got it, didn't they? They got it. I hope we have. If Romans says something interesting. When Romans 13, he says, we have a debt to others. The love that God has given to us and we find it to be vitally important to our being becomes a debt we owe to others. And listen, we have more love than you could ever give away in three lifetimes because the Holy Spirit produces it supernaturally, doesn't he? Well, I don't know. I would better not give too much out. I might run out today. You'll never run out of God's love. In Galatians, the third chapter, I mean, in Galatians, the fifth chapter, he tells us something important. Here's what he says. Now, this is Paul speaking to the Galatian church. Here's what he says. Stop biting and devouring one another. Where was that going on? In the world? No, it's going on in the church. Now, one thing is biting but biting to devour, that's a whole different ball game. You know, was a dog, you're playing with a dog and he nips at you, nips at you. That's one thing. But when another dog comes in and he bites you with an idea to eat you all at one time up. Listen, that's the analogy that Paul used in Galatians. Stop biting to devour one another. Where's that going on? In the church. It must not be. That type of stuff must not be. It must not be. Only place that, only person that can stop that is you. The only place you can stop that is you. Don't walk around with a victim's mentality. All I do is get bit. And don't go around biting. If I get two people to understand that, then we stop that deal. Don't be a victim. Don't walk around with a victim's mentality for people in the flesh to bite you. Let's pray. Hey, Rick. Okay, buddy. All right. I looked around for Mary, and Mary's not back yet. Father, we're so thankful for this day, this time together, for this lesson. Who would go back under the law knowing these conditions? I hope nobody in this church. We've been freed. Live as free men in Christ. I pray today, Father, as we give this offering, it hasn't come by a legal concept. It's come by a proper motivation of love, of an attitude within our heart. It's never about the amount. It's all about the purpose, the motive. I pray we be wise stewards of it, Father, to spend a little on ourselves and more on reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his name we've prayed. Amen.